Okay, uh, it sounds like we're ready to get started. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Welcome. I'm uh, very excited to be here uh, at Mesoscon Asia in China, the first one. I'm honored to be a speaker at this inaugural event. I think it's a very important step. Um, I'm also very proud of IBM, my company, for being a diamond sponsor of Mesoscon. Um, we're a big supporter of Mesos. And um, yesterday, in the keynote, Ben Hyman announced that uh, two IBMers who are in my department uh, became committers. And uh, I just want to say also that uh, our Mesos development that we're doing is mainly, or, or a lot of it, is focused in China. So this is, China is the hotbed of Mesos development here in, in IBM. Um, I also want to say that I'm very, that I'm very blown away by China so far. So I've been here for two days. It's beautiful. Uh, Hangzhou is beautiful. Uh, the, the technology, the <laughs> high-speed trains, everything. I think it's great. And um, I'm only here for another week and a half. So I can already tell it's not enough. So uh, thank you for hosting me. It's a great country. Um, the topic for today is lessons learned running Watson on Mesos in production. Uh, my name is Jason Edelman. I'm in the IBM systems team. Uh, like I said, my team is responsible for uh, the uh, bulk of the Mesos contributions in IBM. Um, we also work on, uh, we're also using it in one of our products. Um, the co-author of this presentation is Chris Luciano from the IBM Watson group, Watson platform team. Uh, he could not be here today. He was supposed to be a, a co-presenter. Uh, he's delivered, he's um, provided a lot of the content that you'll see here. So I will do, try to do it justice, but uh, uh, there, there is, uh, I, can, I can always take questions to Chris if necessary. Okay, does everybody know what Watson is? Okay, everybody? Maybe some people not. So if not, I'll summarize. Watson is IBM's uh, main cognitive computing platform. And Watson, in 2011, so it's already five years ago, Watson became the first computer to beat humans at Jeopardy, which is an American game show. An American game show that requires a lot of knowledge and understanding of human language, of uh, content, a lot of information, but also um, riddles, rhymes, tricks, things like that, that, that typically machines can't do very well. So IBM was able to get uh, Watson to do it. And another, another thing was doing it as fast as it can. Humans can process cognitive information very, very fast because our brains are, are parallel. Um, it was a challenge to get Watson to do it. In the end, this, this is the machine that did it. Uh, it had 90 power seven processors, or, or 90 power seven servers, with 2,880 um, processor threads to get that job done. <clears throat> so it won the first prize, got a million dollars for IBM, which we gave to charity. Okay, so I wanted to give you that context because this is the, uh, Watson is what we put on top of Mesos for a form of Watson, and I wanna show you how we got there. So this is a brief history of Watson. Um, you can see that in 2006, the research department at IBM started to work on it as a project, they do something about cognitive computing. Um, they ended up going for this grand challenge to beat, to beat Jeopardy, which they did in 2011. After that, IBM looked at how they could commercialize this, turn this into um, something that customers could use. The first in healthcare, um, afterwards, shortly afterwards in financial services, and they went out into broader industries. These are all kind of custom solutions done for, for customers in these areas. The last one is the one I wanted to point out. This is the Watson Developer Cloud. So um, we looked at, uh, basically IBM wanted to open up Watson services, the, the valuable content that's inside of Watson, and make that av available for developers to start using. So that started in 2013. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, if you, has, has anybody, has everybody, or has anybody been on Bluenix? Are you everybody aware of Bluemix? Okay, good, good, lots of people are. So this is IBM's um, developer, um, developer portal, or I guess developer cloud, right? So there's a lot of services in Bluemix that developers can use to run, to get 
applications up and running quickly on the web. This is where you'll find Watson as well. So under Watson, you'll see the services, and this is the piece. There's 16 services there now, but there's a lot of things coming all the time. It's, it's been developing very rapidly. Um, a lot of these services are currently running on Mesos, um, and we're working on trying to get everything running on one platform there, so um, that process is, is that, that work is still in progress. Okay, I wanted to say a little bit about the team that did this, right? So the work that we're talking about running Watson uh, on Mesos and Marathon is done by the Watson platform team. So this is a group of uh, people that was originally the cloud arm of Watson um, that uh, ended up take, uh, delivering foundational services to all the Watson services, uh, all the Watson um, applications. <coughs> So they have uh, microservices architecture skills and resources. These guys are good at, you know, they're, they're developers basically, so they have a good technical capability. They currently have a, a, an ecosystem of about 40 microservices running in there. Um, you know, the, the, the customer facing ones is a, is a subset of that, but, but there's about 40 right now, 40 plus. Uh, it's running on a mixture of containers in managed by Mesos Marathon and Netflix OSS, running on uh, VMs and bare metal. Um, I put together a little bit of a timeline of the Watson Developer Cloud. So I said that it started in 2013. Uh, it became, um, so it, it became, it launched in November 2013. That's only three years ago. My point here is that this is a very short timeline that this has all happened, right? So taking Watson, making it available to uh, developers uh, three years ago, or uh, the very first services came out three years ago, um, Two years ago, basically December 2014, there was eight services in beta. Okay, um, a year a year after that, we hit some issues, which I'll talk about. A, uh, less than a year after that, we started moving to Mesos, and then um, one year ago, September 2015, we had our first Watson services running on production with Mesos and Marathon. The first one, 50 50 nodes. So it just started. So one year ago, we started it. Today, we, we've rolled out a bunch of things since then. Today, we have um, 25 of those 40 services. Or sorry, um, uh, 25 of the 40 services are actually running on Mesos and Marathon, um, and they're uh, they're on 1,000 nodes. So we went from 50 to 1,000 nodes in the course of a year. And uh, okay, so now deep. Diving into, diving into this a little bit. Uh, what does the Watson Developer Cloud look like? Or at least the first iteration. So um, this, is, uh, this is basically going back two years. Uh, what we started with is we took the, net, uh, the Netflix OSS stack, right? So we have uh, the Zool for filtering and we have Eureka for service discovery running on VMs, right? With AS using Asgard to deploy them. Um, this actually worked relatively well for most of the services. Uh, so we were able to manage this. And this was really during the, uh, when most of these services were running in beta. Um, oops, go back one. But one of the services hit a problem. So um, our rank and retrieve service is based on Apache Solar, and which is a, um, which is a, a search engine um, that requires uh, loading up of lots of data, right? So um, <clears throat> this, so to deploy, so because it, it requires that, it's not multi-tenant. Uh, you can only have each, each tenant requires its own um, instance of solar, okay? So what we were doing is we were deploying VMs for each tenant that came in. Now the problem with this is that um, we want the deployment to be fast. When a new customer signs up for the service, we want to enable them right away. But wow. deploying these VMs, first of all, there was a manual step. Um, because we were using Asgard, Asgard mainly a GUI. So the request would have to come in, the operator would have to get the request, um, provision the VMs, etc. And then, so the customer has to wait. So that wasn't really good. Um, we wanted to speed this up. We tried automating um, the VM deployment. We, we tapped into the Asgard API 
and we, we tried to run scripts to get this to deploy. Wasn't fast enough. The deploying VMs, VMs are still pretty big. Um, it can take between minutes, and, uh, and on the cloud platform as well, there's certain other variables can take can take longer, right? So this still wasn't good enough. So this kicked off a investigation into containers. Can we run solar? Can we run this uh, uh, retrieve and rank application on containers? So this discussion happened about you know a year and a half ago, March 2015. <coughs> So at that time, uh, there were two options. Uh, really, we could, for, for orchestrating containers. Uh, one option was Kubernetes, and the other one was uh, Mesos and Marathon. Now, the Kubernetes community was pretty much, pretty much brand new, so the team felt it was really young. Um, there was a, the, the community felt divided. And also, there were some issues with uh, using the overlay networks and how that was going to fit in with our existing infrastructure around Zool and Eureka. Um, and then the other option was Mesos and Marathon. And that, that actually <coughs> was quite solid already, right? Um, easy to get started with it. It fit with the existing net. net. It wasn't too hard to adapt to the Netflix OSS stack. Um, had a strong community, good production support, et cetera. So, Um, so last year when we said we went into production, September 2015, this is what our staff looked like. Uh, basically we had, um, we had 100 VMs initially um, on, on uh, 50 nodes. Uh, we had um, you know, Docker 1.7, Mythos uh, 023, Marathon 09, et cetera. Okay. All right, and now this is this is where we are today, which is pretty much what, where we were then, um, but just a little bit more detail, right? So you can see the, the API endpoint at the top. We've got a, a data power edge device um, that provides our public IP. Um, the requests coming in, you know, we have, I have an LDAP server there. The requests coming in go to Zool. Uh, Zool does the filtering, um, passes the request through by ribbon to the, uh, to now either on the bottom here we have um, this is kind of the existing case. We have um, stuff running on, still have some stuff running on VMs and bare metal, and then the rest of the stuff is running in Docker with uh, Mesos and Marathon on uh, some bare metal, some VM. We have our Eureka discovery service there. So basically we're trying to get everything to, as much as possible, put things on a common, um, a, a common um, resource manager Now, moving, I told you that the, uh, the retrieve and rank service based on Apache Solar was the whole thing that initiated uh, this discussion on containers. This is the reason we went to containers, was to speed this up. But moving to containers, we also knew that we had a risk. Um, the risk is that if one of those, if, if one of, because, because uh, Marathon is, is a dynamic, scheduler for resources, things can move around and that wouldn't be good when we're putting stuff uh, into a local, into the local data store which we're using. And I should say that we did try and look at whether we could use remote storage and uh, um, that was not a good option here because what we were told was that solar would not perform well with remote storage. We needed to have local storage. Okay, so that's kind of the constraint. So based on that, the solution that the team came up with was to use Solar Cloud. So Solar Cloud provides mirroring between two solar instances. We make sure that those two solar instances are on separate physical machines. So the logic is, one of the machines goes down, we can still recover on another machine and rebuild the data um, and, and maintain a high availability. Um, okay, so this was the hope, and as it says there, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> we'll see why in a second. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the outages that we had. So you can't get through a year without some uh, growing pains. There were um, three outages I want to go over. Uh, all of them obviously are resolved. We found workarounds. We, we, we managed to deal with them. But I think it's instructive to go through it just for anybody who's looking at deploying uh, a new Mesos and Marathon uh, container uh, 
uh, cloud to, to understand the kinds of skills that are required to support the kind of issues you possibly can face. These, these are some of the tougher ones. All right, so the first one was uh, the zookeeper Chirut. Um, here, the, the issue, well, what we encountered is we were working, we were working with the system adding uh, new applications, and each of these, um, and, and this, is, this is particular again to the uh, random retrieve using Apache Solar, we were adding new tenants with uh, new instances, and as they came on, uh, at some point, we had a problem where basically we had no communication, we couldn't get communication with uh, uh, Marathon anymore, right? Um, it turns out that the reason for this is that Marathon stores its uh, uh, application information, applica the uh, application metadata and environment variables for each of its applications that it runs in Zookeeper, in, in one Zookeeper Z node, uh, which has a maximum capacity of uh, one megabyte. Now, if you think about an application, we had like, we started to have thousands of applications. If you have a thousand applications, each one of them has a thousand bytes, you've already got a megabyte. Um, so, we hit this problem and uh, um, this, this caused an outage. We had to uh, quickly diagnose it. Uh, we got, we, we had to upgrade to a version of uh, Marathon that had some compression that, that kind of uh, improved, the prop, improved the situation a bit. I know they've been working on this and there's some further enhancements coming on this, but this was something that hit us uh, as a surprise and uh, we had to work it out. Um, just, this isn't an outage, but I just wanted to point out something interesting about this, like how we've, something we've also had to deal with as we've grown. Because in, because this uh, retrieve and rank service creates a new set of instances for each tenant, we have thousands and thousands of them. And it's very hard to see, but what, what this is, I kind of pulled out the, the Mesos um, framework table. And you can see that there's six frameworks here. They're all marathon. So we, we had to we had to limit our marathon instances to a thousand um, a thousand applications. And, um, and 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 there you can see they're all a thousand. Um, this is because even if you can get past that uh, that the zookeeper Chirut issue, uh, the marathon GUI can't handle thousands and thousands of applications, so we started to have a problem. When we hit 3,000, it was absolutely not working. At 1,000, it's kind of bearable, so we basically have, have limited it to 1,000 on each one, and we have to have multiple marathons running on top of Mesos, and we have to have uh, some load balancing between them to distribute it. Okay, okay. this is the second evolution. Um, uh, this, so now, we, the strategy was for, for Apache Solar, we have mirroring, right? So we have two instances for each tenant running on two different nodes, okay? And that's supposed to protect us. But what happened to us, actually, is that we lost, we essentially lost contact with all of our containers. The way this happened is we had, um, the network that we're running on wasn't always reliable, so we had some outage where <clears throat> um, Mesos, where Marathon and Mesos were not talking to each other. The connection was lost for a significant amount of time. Uh, we think this is the cause of it. After that significant amount of time, the connection was reestablished. But when Marathon reconnected with Mesos, Mesos thought it was a new Marathon, gave it a new framework ID. So now we have a Marathon running with a new framework ID. We have all these, we have all these original containers still running with the old ID, so they can no longer communicate with Marathon. That means they're basically gonna be dead. So what we tried to do is we, we didn't know how they got into this situation, but because it's running in production, we had to deal with it. We, um, we tried to hack it directly into the Zookeeper <laughs> registry. We tried to reprogram those uh, framework IDs for each of our containers. Um, it worked temporarily, but eventually everything got rescheduled. So essentially, this was a problem. This is this is the problem with stateful services. If you're using stateful services, you have risks like this. Um, so, what to get out of this? We had to do a bunch of manual work. We had to uh, move around all the data to get to the right uh, container after it was rescheduled. 
but for, for the future, to prevent this in the future, we had to develop our own um, pinning functionality so that a container is always going to start on the same node with its data from then on. Um, we had to develop all this uh, kind of infrastructure ourselves on top of uh, Mesos and Marathon. Marathon doesn't support the um, persistent volumes yet, right? Or it persist or supports it in data. Um, so this is the third and, and, and last outage I wanted to cover. Um, this one is also uh, on the uh, on the um, let's say uh, extreme side in the sense that it's a it, it's a race condition, right? We had because of our network problems, we had two network splits that, that happened pretty close together, right? Um, and when we have a network split, split if you still with Mesos if you still have a quorum, it will elect a new leader. So each time it elected a new leader, what happened is that one of the leaders that was lost, that was disconnected in the first round, uh, became a leader later. But while it was disconnected, it missed a bunch of updated state information. So it had stale state information. At the end of all of this, when they, when all these, uh, um, when all these uh, Mesos masters try and talk to each other, try and reach consensus on the replication log, they couldn't, or it got into some kind of state where it would continually, um, they would continually disagree on what was the state and they would continually elect a new master. The, the cluster was unusable. Um, basically, we had to kill all the replication logs, reboot the whole cluster, start it up again. Um, but because we were able to track down this scenario pretty precisely, we were able to, to reproduce the problem, and it was fixed. So, um, I, I, one of the thing, one of the other things we did is we knew that, that our, our network network stability, but also network bandwidth, played a role in this. So, we, we also upgraded our network and, and moved our machines to bare, bare metal that would support a faster network. So that that also was part of the uh, mitigation. But again, this is the kind of issue that you can encounter uh, when setting. Okay, so now I have a bunch of slides. I want to switch to lessons learned, kind of uh, uh, takeaways from the experience that the Watson team had. Uh, the first one is about stateful services, and I know there's a talk going on maybe next door about stateful services, uh, how stateful services are difficult. Sorry, so so I think we agree. Uh, the uh, I guess the message here is if you can. If you don't need, if you can work with uh, centralized storage, um, you know, if you have, if you can afford SSDs and if you can have a, a fast enough network, um, then it's better to do that than to have local data, right? So if you have to have uh, local data, then you have to be aware that you're, you're going to have challenges. Uh, potentially a distributed uh, a file system can help with that. Um, uh, but the, the current solutions of pinning, um, pinning your, your uh, workloads to a particular machine that has the data is kind of a hack um, and uh, it, it is, is brittle, right? It's, it's in a sense, as you scale up, you're more likely to have failures, you're more likely to have an issue with that pinning strategy. Just to have a fast network. Um, Mesos is uh, very chatty. There's a lot of uh, a lot of log uh, um, uh, logs being transferred. Uh, there's a lot of messages, and uh, as a result, we found that even with a relatively small cluster, a one gig e network was uh, not enough. Right, would often get congested. So really pretty much uh, want to get on a 10 gig e network for, for uh, Mesos Marathon. And if you can't, right, uh, do what you can to try and reduce the traffic, um, you know, uh, ma manage your logging better, reduce that, um, and, and work, and you can extend your uh, zookeeper timeouts. Um, okay. This one is about uh, uh, about the design of your microservices. 
So as you saw, the way this process started with Watson, it was originally uh, running on VMs, right? So uh, the first set of services that were designed were all running on VMs. So when we moved to this uh, container-based microservice, microservice uh, architecture, a lot of the development teams just simply ported their VMs over to containers, and that doesn't work very well, right? Um, tends to take, you know, they, they, they tend to have excessive memory requirements, um, there's additional processes running that really should be split out, uh, and which makes it also difficult to optimize your scheduling of, uh, of resources, right? So this is something that um, the, the, the Watson platform team has ended up spending a lot of time um, uh, training the development teams, basically conveying information about good microservice architecture, um, how to minimize the size of your containers, so that the whole network is more flexible and more, more resilient, the whole system. Okay. Um, another uh, lesson we learned was about workload scheduling. So as this, uh, as the system grew bigger, um, there was more challenges with trying to get good utilization out of it. You know that uh, when you're um, when you're you're running um, when you're running workloads, they, they you, you specify uh, your CPU and your memory, and you also know that your machines have CPU and memory limits. Um, it is not easy to get the high memory requiring tasks to run on the high uh, memory machines. Um, at least th these capabilities aren't supported out of the box in Marathon. Uh, so. Um, our, right now, there's uh, 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 really the long-term solution here is to have more advanced workload scheduling capabilities, and that's something that uh, the team that, that I work on uh, at, at uh, Spectrum Computing has a lot of experience in. It's something we hope to help, help the community with. Um, but in the in the short term, uh, basically, we're considering uh, how to use roles and attributes to get this uh, kind of at least at a at a, at a coarse grain level, place the right kind of workloads on the right kinds of machines. Um, the, this, uh, this lesson is about auto scaling. So here, uh, uh, Marathon doesn't support uh, auto scaling out of the box either, right? So, and we're talking about auto scaling of containers. So as workloads increase, and your containers, if you, if you have containers that are supporting multiple users, and you, the users start um, um, congesting, or there's more, there's more activity on your container, you would like it to be able to spawn more containers. You like this to happen on each microservice individually, right? So that you can get some benefit of, of trade-offs between activity between different services. Uh, currently, we don't have this implemented, so. Uh, what we're, um, uh, uh, what we, you know, we looked at some options. There is the, the Marathon LV project, which is potential. Um, the problem there is that for us, that didn't work because uh, uh, it's not compatible with the, the Zool infrastructure that we have. It depends a lot on HA proxy. Uh, we also looked at Aurora. Uh, I think the team wasn't really ready to move to Aurora because of the, um, uh, because it didn't support the REST API and uh, the team wasn't ready to use uh, Thrift. Um, so this is an area that, you know, it's important to have. Uh, we think Marathon ought to have this. Uh, we're, still, we're still working on this solution. Uh, so something to be aware of, though. It's something unique. Okay. And about metrics, metrics are very important when you're running a cluster in production, especially if it gets uh, uh, larger. I guess there's three kind of sub points here. Uh, one is when you're doing maintenance on your cluster and you have a lot of uh, different services uh, running on a single machine, if you take that machine, if you try and upgrade that machine, you do something to it, you're gonna get a lot of alerts from all the services, right? So there's a lot of duplication going on there. Um, and you know, eventually uh, it's difficult to figure out what's going on, you'll get as alert fatigue. So we're starting to use uh, Prometheus, we're starting to look at that. That has a good capability for alert management. 
uh, to, to deduplicate, to re reduce the noise, right, so you can understand what's going on. So I think we think that's an important uh, step to take. Um, again, uh, for managing, we'd like to manage uh, a container better, so we want to understand what is the usage, the, the actual CPU usage, memory usage going on inside each of the containers. So having uh, more capabilities there is, is very important uh, so that you can manage things like over-provisioning um, and, and, and make uh, better scaling decisions. And then capacity planning, of course, you got to understand it. Actually, I think in, in, in Mesos, we're, we really have kind of high-level metrics, but you actually want to understand where, where are all these uh, workloads placed and what is their actual utilization so that you can make uh, um, better decisions there about capacity. Is it an issue of just adding more nodes or is it an issue of being more efficient in your scheduling? Okay. Um, regarding deployment automation, so I guess two points here. One, this uh, we started using Ansible to deploy our services uh, on, onto the nodes. Um, and we discovered that as it started, as the cluster started to get quite large, um, you know, large elaborate playbooks can take quite a while. So it can take quite a while to roll out a, a, a patch or a, a changes uh, for a, a big cluster with this kind of push model. So we are now um, putting more things and packing more things into a Debian to, to download that and have the, the uh, uh, Ansible playbook tr uh, trigger that, but we're not putting too much into Ansible. So that's, that's working for now. Um, you might look as well at uh, uh, more pull kind of technologies when you get into a bigger scale. And then for maintenance, so the, the maintenance primitives that are in Mesos are, are not supported in Marathon yet. Uh, so one of the things we had to do here is just kind of hack our own maintenance strategy. Um, we, we basically uh, reserved resource, we, we, we briefed something up using uh, um, um, getting Zool to uh, filter out some of the traffic on the nodes that we wanted to bring down, um, reserving them in Mesos so that they wouldn't be booked, and then, and then doing our maintenance that way. So I think the absence of, of a good maintenance uh, tool in uh, Marathon is something you have to think about and uh, something you have to be prepared to uh, do a little work to attain. All right, this is actually my last lesson learned here is around chaos testing. Um, this is a strategy from uh, Netflix, and uh, we found it very useful. They uh, basically using uh, testing frameworks and chaos monkeys to uh, generate, to, to cause some uh, disruption to your production environment or pre-production environment for testing purposes to see um, if you can really, if, if all these tools that you put in place will really work, right? So the couple scenarios that we're testing is uh, we, we take down a percentage of the nodes, so we, we, load, it, we load up the traffic in a pre-production environment, uh, we'll take out 25% of the nodes and we'll see how well it handles, can it, can it keep up its SLA um, and, and what's its recovery time. And similarly, we'll do this if we can, we can take out a very busy node, right, as another test that we do. Um, We've um, developed this into a Jenkins script, which each of our teams now can uh, run for self-service. So um, this is something they can all do before they uh, deploy into production. And uh, that's, that's basically it. Um, I think the, the summary, I guess the takeaway from this is that this has been a very successful exercise in adopting this technology. I focused a lot on, on the challenges that we had because this is kind of what we've, what we've learned out of it. But we have, we've gone from 50 to 1,000 in a year. Um, we have achieved, we calculated that we achieved four nines availability uh, for all of the months this year except for one month, which was when we didn't have enough capacity. <laughs> um, we're running uh, smoothly in production. Uh, things, th this service is expanding quite rapidly. Um, all, all of our Watson, uh, uh, Watson services that we're offering. Um, having good architecture development skills is really important uh, for a team to be able to support um, you know, this open source technology in-house in production, right? So um, you, need, you need to have that because you'll have to get, you, may, you have to be prepared to deal with some pretty tricky situations. Um, 
our advice for new users is uh, um, you know, stateful, beware of stateful services you know, until hopefully there's some better support for it. Um, get the fastest network you can. Make sure that you, your developers know how to design for a proper microservice architecture. Um, there's more work to be done on scheduling, on auto-scaling, metrics, maintenance, et cetera. And do chaos. I think that's it. I think uh, we're, as, as uh, I think IBM is very happy, I speak on behalf of IBM, that we're very happy to be participating in this community. Uh, we look forward to working on some of these problems to help make uh, Mesos uh, better and, and improve it uh, for uh, a smoother experience for all users in the future. Cool. Thank you.